we know you will appreciate his topic, The Breath of God. And now, Frater Poole. Frater's and Sorars, recently I observed a spear of grass coming through a hairline crack in a solid piece of concrete, which I happen to know had been in place for a period of over 10 years. To me, this simple event illustrates the tenacity of life, the fact that life in itself is a force that has the potential to exist regardless of what may be the impediments to its survival. That grass should grow from a seed through a hairline crack in a solid piece of concrete means that the seed had lain dormant over a long period of time and yet the life force that existed within it was still present and able to develop into a living entity. This life force is a part of the essence of the cosmic force that is at the center of all manifestation in the universe. Regardless of what we call it, this force is an existent that continues to function and to express itself throughout all the physical manifestation of which we are aware with our physical ability to perceive. We refer to the underlying force as life, but we could refer to it as a fundamental force, or if you prefer, we might say it in one word, God. I intend to use the word God simply because I take that word to mean what I believe it generally means and has meant to philosophers and theologians in the history of Western thought, as well as to almost all individuals who ever gave it any consideration. That is, it is the word that exists in common usage. There are objections to the use of God today, but regardless of what we call this ultimate or fundamental force, the fact is that something exists outside the physical universe that evidently is related to its cause and to its continuance. All metaphysical theories lead to the problem of God, which is the supreme problem of philosophy. To arrive at the ultimate reality is, of course, the purpose of metaphysical inquiry. Usually, we consider this final or absolute force by any terminology that we want to apply to it. But as a matter of convenience, the word God does as well as any other term, regardless of what may be our attitude toward that type of terminology. The universe, according to most modern scientific thought, began with what is occasionally referred to as the Big Bang, that is, a type of explosion related to nuclear energy brought about the beginning of an expanding universe that is still in the process of expansion and in an evolving state where various changes are taking place. Back through periods of time that are impossible for us to properly imagine or evaluate, this expanding universe has gone on and on, possibly originating from what is now referred to as a black hole. The universe expands at a rate that we cannot conceive of in our ordinary conception of time. I believe that what is called the first Big Bang was not the beginning of the universe, but rather the beginning of a cycle, that the universe has not had a beginning, that it has always existed and has gone through numerous cycles of expansion and contraction. These expansions and contractions can figuratively be conceived as the breath of God. God breathing outwardly could be the allegorical interpretation of an expanding universe, which will eventually reach a point 
where the breath will begin to be taken in and the universe will again contract over a period of many million years and return to a state of a black hole in which all energy, life, and physical manifestation will be contained. This, then, is a concept of a universe expanding and contracting, and a force that exists behind the expansion and contraction, which we might as well, to use the term again, refer to merely as God. The concept of God, of course, has changed over the relatively short period of man's history on Earth. When we consider the concept which I have just referred to as a period of an expanding and contracting universe, the period of man's existence is but a fraction of a second in comparison. Nevertheless, man places his value on life as one of his prized possessions, and he has attempted during his period of living on Earth to deal with the problem of God, that is, the problem of first and absolute causes and the problem of purpose. There was a time when man looked upon God in an anthropomorphic sense, that is, he considered God simply as a superhuman being. The concept of Jehovah in the Old Testament created for us a picture of a human-like being, possibly a man with a beard sitting on a throne. Early in life, I lived in an environment in which this concept of God was prevalent. When it was considered that he was watching each individual, and it reminded me of my grandfather, who also had a beard and was sometimes stern in correcting me. I was always in fear that God would catch me doing something that I shouldn't be doing. However, that concept of God as an individual entity being the designer and captain of man's fate has gradually disappeared or is in the process of disappearing in man's thinking, except in some very fundamental religious doctrines. During the Renaissance, some individuals found that they could be, to a degree at least, the ultimate determiners of their own fate, that the earthly existence of mankind was no longer, as in the medieval concept, weary exiles on the way to the spiritual destiny of their soul. Rather, thinking men and women believed that they could evolve their soul and thereby adapt themselves to an expanding and growing universe. Their position in the universe then becomes that of observers who try to fit themselves into the forces that exist in this universe of which mankind is a part. Ancient man tried to determine what his position was, and that, in a sense, started man's reflection upon his position in the universe. It still continues, and now man has evolved to what is considered to be a highly advanced state. In the final analysis, we must remember that in the search for meaning, we must not forget that God is a concept only of the human mind. In other words, the concept of God is within man's mind, not in a God's mind. God needed to be invented to give meaning and purpose to the puzzle that is life on earth. The concept of God was needed to explain the strange and irregular phenomena of nature, the haphazard vents that occur, and above all, to explain irrational human conduct. The, conduct. the concept of God also exists to bear the burden of all things that cannot be comprehended except by supernatural intervention or design. This means that the human being needs a God. We need the concept of a force outside ourselves 
to fill the void that exists if nothing is considered except the physical entity that each of us is here on earth. How then, with all these different concepts that have existed through the man's history of God, can we explain the real meaning of God and to put it into proper perspective today? What, for example, should be the Rosicrucian attitude toward God? How should the individual member look at that concept or consider it? This might be illustrated by an unusual illustration. Can you imagine a tribe of human beings that lived in an isolated area and were born with a deformity, a deformity in which the cornea of the eye was colored. In other words, every one of these individuals would be seeing the world, seeing the sun, the sunlight, the moonlight, just the same way in which you and I would see it if we were looking through colored glasses. Imagine further that these individuals each were different, that no two had the identical colored cornea, that every one of them looked out on the world and saw sunlight, for example, in terms of the color of the cornea of their individual eye. The important consideration in this illustration is that each individual then would have his own realization of sunlight. Each would perceive sunlight in accordance to his own physical equipment. But that does not change the sunlight. The sunlight is the same for each of these individuals as it is for us. And so it is. The concept of God continues to change with each of us. We each conceive God in accordance to our realization, but that does not change God or whatever the fundamental force of the universe is that is behind all manifestation. Realization, the God of our realization then, is the God that is important to each Rosicrucian. I believe that this mystical interpretation has the answer to the question. God is different for me than for you. After all, the ultimate God is the God of our individual realization. In this living universe in which we have our being, we are a part of God's expanding and contracting breath in accordance with our realization of that concept. Our program today, The Breath of God, was produced in the studio of the Rosicrucian Order. The Rosicrucians are a non-profit, non-sectarian, educational and fraternal organization with international headquarters located in San Jose, California. We hope you've enjoyed this program, that you have benefited from the personal insights expressed and that you will join us again for another challenging presentation of Rosicrucian thought.